Hello, Guten Morgen developers. Hello, come on. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining in today. My name is Tanmay Bakshi. And as a developer, my passion lies where innovation and technology intersect. And to me, that is absolutely exciting. But before I talk about that, I want to start off by saying a huge thank you to the entire team at We Are Developers for putting together such a wonderful event here in Vienna. I'm super excited to be here today. I'm sure you're going to be learning a lot and having a lot of fun over the next two days. So a huge round of applause for the team for putting together this event. Thank you. Now, of course, while I work with technology in a wide variety of different ways, I am a developer at heart. And so developer events are the ones that excite me most. And you know, speaking about learning of technology, before I begin today, I want to start off by giving you all a little bit of a brief tour of my journey into the world of technology and how I started working with the world of tech in the first place. And like any good tour, we're going to have to start off at the very beginning. So let's travel back in time by around 11 years, back to when I was five years old. Now, back as a curious five-year-old is how I got into the world of technology. I was absolutely fascinated by it. And I started to use the internet and different books as learning resources. In fact, I'm glad to say that when I was nine, I had my very first iOS application called T-Tables accepted into the Apple App Store. Now, this led me to start my YouTube channel called Tan May Teaches. And in turn, this led me to initiate my goal to reach out to and help at least 100,000 aspiring coders, to really help them innovate along their journey of learning to code. In fact, I'm really glad to say that so far, I'm around 15,000 people there, and I'm always working towards this goal through numerous different media. I mean, of course, there's my YouTube channel, but then there's the talks, the workshops, the keynotes that I have at schools, universities, and conferences across the globe making it so that if someone has an idea, they have the skills to implement technology where they believe it can make an impact. In fact, I'm also very glad to say that just this year, in order to scale up the number of people I could reach out to, I had three of my books published. Hello, Swift, Cognitive Computing, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is Cognitive Computing with IBM Watson and Tan May Teaches Julia. But hold on a second. I know I got a little bit ahead of myself, so let's rewind for just a moment. Now, we're talking about Watson and Julia, but you're probably wondering, well, how did I get into the world of next generation technology in the first place? And well, to do that, let's go back to when I was 11 years old. Now, of course, when I was 11, technology would fascinate me but I wasn't as interested in it as I was just a few years ago. And the reason, personally, was very simple. I felt like I didn't have that next big thing to do with tech. I didn't have that next big challenge to work towards, ch to work towards solving. But I'm lucky, actually, because while I would have found something eventually, I found something that, for me personally, actually redefined what it meant to develop. And that was the day I stumbled upon IBM Watson and how it not only played, but also won the Jeopardy game show against the two best human competitors back in 2011. Now, when I stumbled upon this, as you can imagine, I was immediately fascinated. I mean, think about it. Even today, natural language understanding is relatively rudimentary compared to where it should be. But nine years ago, this technology was practically unheard of. And still, Watson was able to decipher the kinds of puns, riddles, and wordplay in Jeopardy clues, more complex than the vast majority of today's natural language understanding systems can comprehend. And so when I stumbled upon this, I was immediately hooked to the concept of machine learning. And really, ever since then, I've been working towards implementing machine learning technology in a wide variety of different fields, in fact, in practically every application that I develop. Now, the two fields where I personally provide a sort of special emphasis on my implementation of machine learning are the fields of healthcare and education. But I've worked towards applying it in a wide variety of different fields. As a matter of fact, let me give you a few examples. From a technologically fascinating perspective, I've worked on a project 
called a pronunciation predictor. The idea behind this project is that not only does it use a sequence-to-sequence -sequence neural network in order to try and predict the phonemes that go behind pronouncing a certain word, but it'll actually use auxiliary information, like, for example, the etymology of a word or the language families it comes from in order to augment its predictions. I've worked on an application called Tandro, which stands for Tanmay's Drone, which is essentially a machine learning powered natural language interface to help you co-pilot a drone intuitively. So you can quite literally control a drone, drone through text messages, through SMS using Twilio. And this has a number of practical applications. Ima ima imagine firefighters being able to use this to fight fires more effectively. And in the combined field of both healthcare and education, I'm working on a project in the field of dyslexia. And did you know that over 20% of people worldwide suffer from some sort of dyslexia? That is over a billion people worldwide that suffer from dyslexia. And what I'm doing is I'm creating machine learning powered applications that for the very first time enable an intuitive and a natural experience for dyslexic students to learn how to read. I'm also working on a project that provides a kind of artificial communication capability to people who are unable to communicate naturally, or people who have lost their natural communication ability to a disease or maybe to an accident. And the way it works is by understanding electroencephalogram, EEG, essentially your brain waves. And this is the most complex biosignal in the human body. As a matter of fact, I have reached the first milestone of this project, which of course is mental state recognition. Now, this doesn't just look at the frequency domain of your EEG and look at the alpha frequency and say, hey, you're relaxing. Rather, it understands the raw electroencephalogram through a combination of convolutional and recurrent neural networks in a custom architecture. So I'm working on a bunch of different projects that use the power of machine learning, and these are just a few examples. But out of all these different projects, there are three technologies that I'm working with that I believe you would be really fascinated by. Three projects that I really want to focus on today. And we're going to start off with a project of mine that uses the power of machine learning in biometric security. Next up, we're going to get into compilers and developer tooling, which is something I know you'll all be super fascinated by. And finally, I'm going to give you a sneak peek into the future of computing. But we'll keep that as a surprise for later. So let's start off with a project of mine that uses the power of machine learning in the field of biometric security. Now, you may be wondering, well, what have I done with biometrics? Well, I have invented a brand new kind of biometric authentication. It uses machine learning, specifically deep learning algorithms. And the way it works is that it can authenticate you based off of your electrocardiogram, your ECG, the electrical activity of your heart. That's right, at this point, I can identify you based off of the way your heart beats. As a matter of fact, I'm really glad to say, in fact, I'm honored that just a few days ago, Heart ID actually won the Reader's Choice Award at the HPC 2019 conference for the best use of high performance data analytics and artificial intelligence. So I'm really honored by that, and I'm super excited about this project. So now, Heart ID has a few main stages to it. The first one is development training. You don't exactly need to worry about how that works, but the second, which you do need to worry about, is production training. Now, in production training, it's just one simple phase. You feed Heart ID with your raw electrocardiogram data, and what it's going to do is it's going to filter it. It's going to find the R peaks in the heartbeat data. It'll center each R peak, filter it a little bit, make sure it's clean, and it'll extract some features from it and put it into a database. Now, here's the interesting part. Once we've got these feature vectors, I can then use my neural networks to actually analyze those feature vectors in the production inference stage. And these feature vectors enable me to figure out who someone is based off of new raw electrocardiogram data. Now, here's the best part. Your privacy is never violated, because raw ECG is never stored on device. I mean, take a look at this. What I did is I took the feature vectors that the neural network generated for the heartbeats from both me and my sister, and I visualized them. As you can see, they're totally different. And so the neural network was able to realize that, hey, these two heartbeats came from two totally different individuals. But personally, I feel like Heart ID is just one of those projects where you need to see it, not just hear about it. So what I would love to do now is show you all a demo 
of heart ID in action. Now for this, I'm going to invite Amin up to the stage. Where is he? Come on, there he is. Thank you very much. Round of applause for Amin. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so here is the idea of the demo. Thank you very much, Amin, for volunteering. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some electrodes onto Ammon, some little sensors. And I'm going to gather some electrocardiogram from his wrists. It's going to go over to my computer, and then from my computer, you'll be able to see it on screen. Now, I'm first going to gather some ECG and train the system on his heartbeat. It's already been trained on my heartbeat. My data's already been fed in, because I didn't want to have to you know, have you sit through 30 more seconds of loading data in. Then what we're going to do is we're going to feed in new, uh, new data from Ammon, and we're going to ask it to identify. And theoretically, it should tell us that Ammon is the one feeding in data. Then we'll switch electrodes. I'll wear them, feed my data in, and it should tell you that I'm the one uh, that's feeding in data. Let's have a, you can have a seat, and let's get started. So I'm going to switch over to my computer so you can actually take a look at what we're doing here. Wonderful. All right, as you can see, I've got the binary open, and I've got these little sensors, and we're going to talk about how I actually collect data in just a moment. Because, of course, when it comes to machine learning, you not only have to worry about the models and the architectures, you've got to worry about how data is collected and how it's actually fed into the system. We're using some special devices to have this happen. There we go. I'm just going to clip this on. And just like that, we have data streaming to my computer. Now, when I actually run the binary file that does the training, which is called main conveniently, I'm going to tell it to remember that whoever's data you're seeing, his name is Amen. So we're going to run that. And just like that, it's going to import TensorFlow, all the different libraries it needs, Pi Audio, everything. And there we go. We've got a little matplotlib window, and it's got electrocardiogram streaming in. Now, here's the interesting part. What you're seeing, we'll zoom in in just a moment. We're getting clean electrocardiogram from a mobile device. That is exceptional. Any moment now, it should zoom in right as we reach around the 3,000 mark. There we go. Now, when the graph stops updating like it has now, we can go ahead and close it. And what's happened is I have trained the system on Ammon's heartbeat, and it's built a profile with both my heartbeat and Ammon's heartbeat. So now, let's take a look at what happens if we run a different command. This time, we're going to do an identify. So let's go ahead and run that. It's going to gather some new electrocardiogram. And here's the theory. It should go ahead and tell us that, well, Ammon is the one running, uh, running the demo or getting electrocardiogram. As you can see, it's going to go ahead and stream in some new raw ECG. And again, this is not being filtered in any way just yet. The hard ID package takes care of all of that. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. As you can see, graph has stopped updating. One thing to keep in mind is that because we're in a stage environment, there may be electrical noise. So let's go ahead and try this out. And as you can see, if I go ahead and highlight this percentage over here, Ammon is chosen as the correct answer. And you can see a percentage of confidence there greater than mine. So it worked with Ammon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much, Ammon, as well. But now, let's see what happens if I feed my data in. So, Ammon, you can just uh, get up for a moment, stay on stage for just one more minute. Thank you very much. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take off my watch just to make sure we don't get any electrical noise. And I'm going to take the electrode, strap it onto my wrist, take another electrode, go on the other one. Remember, the way electrocardiogram is gathered is you're finding the difference in the electrical signal from two different sides of your body. Now, when you get you know, data from your wrists or your hands like this, it's called lead eye ECG. Now, lead eye is really convenient because it doesn't really matter where on your hand or wrist you get it. Other leads of electrocardiogram are more sensitive to where you get it from your body. Uh, and so now, we go ahead and run an identify. So I'm just going to sit here, be quiet for a moment, so we introduce as few motion artifacts as possible. This will take around 20 seconds. It's been hard-coded to gather that much data. Halfway there. All right, there we go. The graph has stopped updating, and now, if I go ahead and take off these electrodes, I close the window, it should run the prediction using the machine learning model. And there we go. Tanmay is the correct answer. And that is what my neural network says. 
And so that was a quick demo of Heart ID in action. Thank you very much, Emin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really hope you enjoyed that demo. And remember, Heart ID is powerful, but it can really only be as powerful as the developers that incorporate it in their applications. And that's why I'm glad to say that Heart ID is as simple as a few lines of code to integrate into your application. All you need to do is you need to somehow acquire some electrocardiogram data from your users. And once you acquire that data, it's as simple as feeding it into Heart ID, and it'll do all the processing, all the filtering, everything that needs to be done to ensure that I can identify from that electrocardiogram. But there's a little bit of a problem. You see, it's really inconvenient when packages like this one expect you to have some sort of cooking show magic where you just pull out some data and feed it into, into, the, into the package. And so this is why I've also made it super convenient for you to even gather electrocardiogram data. Now, Amon may have noticed, you may not have because you didn't see the device, that in order to capture electrocardiogram in this case, I'm using a special device called the CardioMobile by AliveCore. It was built to do atrial fibrillation detection, and AliveCore has their own application, and they use the CardioMobile with it. Now, the Cardia Mobile communicates with the application in a really special way. They don't use Bluetooth or some other communication protocol you'd expect. They actually use ultrasonic audio in order to communicate with the application. So what happens is the Cardia Mobile will actually take the ECG, modulate it onto some audio, send that audio to your phone, your phone will pick it up and demodulate it. Now, thanks to the FDA, we know that the carrier frequency for the Cardia Mobile is 18.8 kilohertz. And here's the interesting part. Technically, AliveCore says that the communication protocol is proprietary and that only AliveCore can use that protocol. But thanks to the wonders of open source technology, there is a GitHub package by David Maddell called HSH Signal, Heart Shield Signal, and he has done a tremendous job of taking every single filter and transform necessary to take raw audio and convert it to ECG from the Cardia Mobile and he's put it all into one Python package. Now, there are a bunch of different modules here. It uses interoperability between C and C++ and Python with Cython. And that means that the code base is inherently complex. Now, these are the filters that are being run on the audio in order to get electrocardiogram. This is essentially FM demodulation that's happening. And this is the way the particular package is structured. Every single filter inherits from a class called filter block, and then the FIR filter, finite impulse response, filter is what deals with all the convolving filters. Now, if you yourself want to take a look at this code base, I would recommend you look at these three files first. And the reason I say that is because, again, it is inherently a very complex code base. It took me a day and a half just to decipher how the package is structured. And that's not any fault of David's. In fact, the fault is with the interoperability between Python and C++ through Cython. Again, it is innately messy. And what that also means is that it's not particularly high performance because we're using a bunch of NumPy packages and Python operations in between as well. So here's what I did. I took every single operation down to the very base level that this package runs, including the fast Fourier transforms, the control loops, the finite impulse response filters, everything that goes behind it. And I rewrote it all from scratch in C++. So I did that, and it's fast. It's great. But then I realized another problem. Sure, I wrote all this code, but C++ was never meant to do things like audio streaming from a microphone in an easy way, at least. And so as I was on this world of C++, looking over at the world of Python with packages like PyAudio, I was wondering, well, it's tempting to just go back over to Python and re-implement it in a way that I can interoperate with these packages. I mean, it's just three or four lines of code to stream data from a microphone with Pi Audio. Now, I could have taken the easy way out, and I could have just slapped a couple of C wrappers on my C++ code, compiled it to a shared library, and imported C types to import that C code into, uh, into my Python code. But first of all, that would be way too easy. There has to be a catch somewhere. And the second is the catch was performance. Not in the actual calling. The calling is pretty quick. 
But then here's the thing. My implementation is fast, but it's not fast enough to work in real time as samples are gathered from the microphone. And so I needed to have a multi-threaded approach where one thread was actually gathering microphone data, one thread was actually processing it in the background and putting it uh, into, uh, into an array, and then from there the main thread was actually plotting it out with matplotlib. And so Python simply wouldn't work. Reason? Because of a very controversial topic known as the global interpreter lock. <laughs> you probably knew I was going to bring this up. See, the problem is concurrency in Python isn't really concurrent when it comes to threading. And I know what you're saying. Well, why not use multiprocessing? Here's the problem. Interprocess communication has way too much overhead. So there's way too much delay going from the microphone gathered as sample every you know, tenth of a second, going to the other process, processing it through C++, putting it back in another array, and having the main thread analyze it. So way too much overhead, simply impractical. And so global interpreter lock and multiprocessing simply wouldn't let me implement this with Python. And so I thought, well, I have two favorite programming languages. And one of them is particularly well suited for this application. You might know where I'm about to go with this. My favorite language is Swift, by far. Now, the reason, of course, is because, first of all, compared to Python, Swift is a compiled language. And in fact, it's compiled with LLVM's compiler infrastructure, no less. And what that means is it's using proven optimizations, and it is, a, it is, an, it is inherently a very fast language. And here's the kicker. Not only is Swift fully interoperable with Objective-C, it's also fully interoperable with both C and Python. You can import Python code natively into Swift, and Swift even has the dispatch library by Apple that makes it super easy to implement multi-threaded code across platforms, not just Mac OS. And so I'm glad to say that, well, the demo you just saw, the demo of plotting out with matplotlib, using Pi Audio to collect microphone data, and using my C++ code to actually filter that audio and find the electrocardiogram, all of it was written in Swift. And I'm also glad to say that even though it's written in Swift, which is a language that is stereotypically known to not be portable, this has been tested and is known to work on Ubuntu Linux and Mac OS on x86. And here's the interesting part. It even works on IBM's power architecture. I don't even need to change a single line of code. I take all of my code as it works normally, I put it on this exotic architecture, and it works just like that. And so Hard ID is scalable, it works on cross architectures, across platforms, across operating systems, it uses Swift to bind together all these individual pieces, and here's the best part, the Alive Core Decoder module is actually going to be open source on my end as well. So if you want to take all this Swift, Python, and C++ code, extend it, integrate it in your own applications, feel free to do so, it will be open source on my GitHub. And so that is just one of the projects of mine that uses machine learning technology, this one in the field of biometric security. So when it comes to developing powerful applications like this, as developers, we not only have to build the applications themselves, we have to build the infrastructure that goes behind developing those applications in the first place. Now, developers aren't necessarily known to be the best at writing tests and running tests for their code. That is a stereotype for developers, and I hope to change that. And the way I'm working towards that is by creating tooling, developer tooling, that uses features of new compilers in order to create a next generation code quality assurance tool that enables you to automate some of the ways that you test your code. Now, this isn't meant just for small projects. What I'm working on here is a project at IBM, and this project aims to deal with the largest projects there are. Projects with tens of millions of lines of code and hundreds of thousands of test cases. Now, when it comes to projects like these, no single developer, no single individual knows everything about that code. If you change something in module A, you have no clue if you should be running tests for module D because, well, you don't know if there's a link between them. So either you run extra test cases that waste compute power and time, or you don't run enough and you don't catch bugs until you run all of your test cases. And so this is why this next generation code quality assurance tool is helping me to answer three main questions. First of all, for every test case, can we somehow quantify what exactly that test case is doing? Number two, 
when a developer submits a pull request to GitHub, what changes have they actually made to the code? Have they renamed a function? Have they split a function in two? Have they merged two functions? Have they changed what a function does but kept the name the same? Have they changed the structure of their application entirely? Is it totally different? How do we know what the changes actually mean? It's not as simple as a git diff. And then from there, number three, how do those changes actually relate to the individual test cases? Now, this is where machine learning comes in, number three. But let's take a step back. What is the hardest question to answer in this list? Now, on the top of your head, it might seem like maybe number two or maybe number three, but actually, the hardest question to answer here is number one. What does a test case even do? What code paths does it invoke within the certain application that you're running? And so this is why, in order to answer this question, I've had to innovate on a scale of compiler technologies and now, I'm really glad to show you a brand new project of mine, low latency function level instrumentation. Being able to create stack traces in real time of a running program after having inserted instrumentation at compile time. Now again, I feel like this is one of those projects where just me talking about it isn't nearly as impactful as actually taking a look at a demo in action. So let's take a look at a demo of this low latency instrumentation running in real time. And I've got a special little surprise for you at the end as well. Now, as you can see, I'm running this on an Ubuntu machine. I've got a little folder open up here. Uh, it's called instrumentation tests. If I open up test.c, as you can see, super, super simple C++ code, printing out the factorial of five, but with a little extra fills, we've got a decrement function instead of just a factorial function. That's just so we have a few more function calls. Now, I'm going to disable optimization because optimization would just inline everything. In fact, it would even do constant folding, so it would hard code print 120. So we're not gonna do any optimizations. So I'm going to quit out of him here, and we're going to do a simple clang test.c. Super easy. And if I run the binary, nothing special, because we just compiled it normally. But how about this? I'm going to recompile this program. And let me just make sure of one thing really quickly. I ensure that the RAM disk is empty. Oh, sorry. Dash n1. Oop. There we go. Wonderful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass four extra flags to Clang. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it, load in this compiler extension. And the way I'm going to do that is by passing it an actual path to the compiler extension. So just pass it the compiler extension. Then I'm going to tell it that you need to compile test.c, and you need to link against a library called tbcallTracer. Compiles just as normal, nothing extra. And watch this. If I run the final binary, it's remarkably unremarkable. There's nothing special to see here. But that's exactly what makes it so unique. So watch this. If I go ahead and show you the contents of my RAM disk, we've got a trace file. It's only 84 bytes. This trace file contains hashed function names telling me what each function did. Did it enter? Did it exit? And that is low latency instrumentation. But I know that just getting a call stack for a simple program like this is super easy. You can do it with basically any tool out there. There's LLVM X-Ray. Clang has a built-in F instrument functions option. So why did I have to build this entire suite of tooling? Well, it's because it works exceptionally well with large projects. So let's just say I go back a directory, and let's actually go into the C Python directory. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to compile the entire Python interpreter, and I'm going to do it with, of course, this new function instrumentation tool. First, I'm going to clear out my RAM disk, like so. And now, all I need to do is show you my environment. All I did is pass the C flags and linker flags to the Python make, and make with 12 processes. There we go. We're compiling the Python interpreter. This should take no more than around 30 seconds, normally, and with the tracer. And any moment now, we're going to have a Python binary that we can run and use as normal. Now, the master branch of the Python interpreter currently is at version 3.9 alpha, uh, alpha 0, I believe. So let's go ahead and try that out. So if I run dot slash Python after clearing out my RAM disk once more, it works as normal. Nothing special. And I can import whatever libraries I need to. I can you know, just import glob, say, and I can print out every 
folder in this directory totally normally. Everything works, no everything works fine, and it's super fast, too. But watch, right as I exit the Python interpreter, and if I take a look at my RAM disk, like so, we've got a trace file, 20.2 million bytes. And the reason that file isn't too huge is because I am actually at compile time hashing every function name to a 32-bit hash. And all of this is happening in real time. It's not a probing architecture. It doesn't miss individual function calls that are super fast. It gets every function call, and it's able to tell me what is happening within a certain program. This is particularly well suited to very large projects like Python and can even scale up to code bases like IBM's DB2. Now, I wish I could show you a demo of this whole suite today, but very soon, within the next few weeks, I will be able to do so. And this is some real-time function instrumentation in action. I really do hope that more developers can get their hands on this very, very soon. And so that is one of my projects in the world of developer tooling, basically trying to make the lives of developers easier so they can work on writing great code. And now, finally, before I go today, there is one more thing that I want to show you. I want to give you a little bit of a sneak peek into the future of technology, something that personally excites me a lot, something that I'm absolutely fascinated by. Now, this is a future of technology that I believe will kind of redefine what it means to develop in the first place. And this is an unintuitive world. Charles Bennett said, get ready to think outside a box you never even knew existed. And who is Charles Bennett, you may ask? Well, Charles Bennett is the father of quantum information theory. That's right. Welcome, everyone, to the world of quantum computing. Now, as I mentioned, quantum computing is something that I'm personally very fascinated by. And the fundamental idea, if you boil away all the excess and what people talk about, is that we can use quantum mechanics, like superposition and entanglement, to accelerate the way certain niche tasks run. Now, these, these sorts of mechanics, quantum mechanics, are inherently unintuitive to us as humans. Even Albert Einstein, one of the greatest human minds, called entanglement spooky action at a distance. And when it came to superposition, Albert Einstein said, I'm convinced that God does not throw dice. But then, in response, Niels Bohr, the father of the idea, said, Einstein, don't tell God what to do. <laughs> and so even some of the brightest human minds can be perplexed by these sorts of quantum mechanics. But essentially the idea, again, is that there's some sort of tasks that we run on classic computers that are, of course, implemented mathematically that will inherently run faster if you implement them in a quantum physical circuit. Like, for example, molecular dynamics is prime for this sort of application. Instead of simulating individual quantum act interactions with mathematics, you can simulate them with actual quantum physics actually running quantum operations on a physical quantum computer. In fact, to show you that this world of quantum computing isn't as far away as you may think, I've put together a little bit of an example. Now, there is a task known as the Delayed Choice Quantum Eraser, which you may have heard of. It's usually implemented as an optical circuit, and this optical circuit costs tens of thousands of dollars to implement. But I didn't exactly want to spend all of that money. And so I re-implemented it, not as an optical circuit, but as a quantum computer circuit, as a Qiskit circuit, sp to be specific. Now, here's the interesting part. The delayed choice quantum eraser shows something that looks to be retrocausality, but isn't actually retrocausality. Essentially, it's kind of like cause and effect in reverse. Something you may or may not do in the future will affect the measurements that you make today. Super fascinating stuff, but I think it's, again, way better to see it in action than it is just to hear it. So let's take a look. So what I'm going to do once again is switch over to my computer. And as you can see, I've got an application known as the IBM Q experience opened up on my, opened up on my computer. Now, this IBM Q experience, I've opened up a little circuit called the Delayed Choice Quantum Eraser. Let me give you a quick explanation of what's happening. Now, on the first line over there, you can see individual operations that I'm running on the 0th, I'll call that the first qubit. Now, the first qubit, all I'm doing is I'm putting it in superposition, I'm running a 
had him our gate. I'm, I'm running a little flip. I'm just rotating the qubit a little bit. And then I'm removing it from superposition. Now, if I measure it, and if I measure it, say, 8,000 times, then I should see a kind of interference pattern where we have a large bar in the bar graph, two small ones, another large bar in the bar graph of measurements. But here's the thing. If I actually go ahead and observe before I run this little flip over here, before I run this flip, if I observe through this qubit what the result of the superposition is, then we will no longer see that interference pattern. But wait a second. Look at this. There is a 50% chance that this third qubit will discard the information that it observed about the first qubit. There is no way to get that information back. And so, what happens is that even though we actually measure this first qubit before the discard happens, based off of whether that discard would have happened or not, which is a perfect 50-50 chance, we will or will not see an interference pattern. Now, before, while I was setting up, before this keynote, I saw that IBM Q, of course, they've only got a few physical quantum computers. They'll still put it, they're still pretty rare. And so there were a few jobs lined up in the queue that people wanted to run their applications on. And so I actually ran this application before the keynote so we could get some results by now. So let's actually see if those results came in. Give that just a moment. And there we go. We do get our results. I ran this on the London, uh, on the London, uh, IBM Q London, IBM Q, IBM Quantum Computer. So if we go ahead and click on the results, give that just a moment, it'll go ahead and show you the transpiled circuit. And just like that, it shows you our interference pattern. Now I want you to take a look at the left. Now inherently, there is a certain bias in today's quantum computers towards actually measuring certain states over other states. That is quantum error, and it's something that IBM is working towards reducing. In a perfect world, the first bore four bars would be approximately the same height. But based off of bias, you can, you can correct that a little bit, and they're essentially the same height. But look at this. The next four bars show the interference pattern that I was talking about, and this interference pattern is being shown based off of whether in the future, after the measurement, we would have discarded that information. That is absolutely incredible. It is a demo of quantum mechanics running in real life. And as a matter of fact, if you want to run that circuit today, you can open up the IBM Q experience right now on your phones, and you can use a real quantum computer today. I think that is absolutely incredible that we can do that. We can just open up a web browser and use a quantum computer. And I cannot wait to see where this technology goes in the future. It is going to fundamentally change what we do as developers. And I believe that we're really going to have to throw out of our minds this world of classical computing and rethink algorithms and even entire, entire pipelines in a new and unique way. And so once again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in. I really appreciate you joining this early morning for this keynote. And the reason that I have personally been so excited for this event is because, well, we are developers. I mean, I'm a developer hard. Yeah, thank you. And, and the thing is, I believe that developers, we don't just write code. We don't just write programs. Developers. We solve problems. We solve the world's problems with the power of the code that we write. And so I really hope that going into the future, we can work together, we can collaborate, we can enhance the open source community, we can work together to solve the world's pressing problems with the power of code and with the power of next generation technologies. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanmay. Thank you. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for some questions. So let's see. This is an interesting one here. The certainty percentage difference for heart ID between you two seem quite low. Is that something to be expected? Sure thing. Now, two things there are to realize. The data set that I used to train this neural network came from a researcher from Russia in St. Petersburg in 2005. Now, when they recorded this data, it was done in practically a lab environment. The data wasn't clean, necessarily. They did a lot of post-processing, but they had people sit down and collect data using professional electrocardiogram recording equipment. Now, when they did so, they ran a series of proprietary sort of transformations that I have not been able to particularly replicate 
And because of that, the neural network is trained on slightly different data than, the, than we are actually capturing today. The Cardia Mobile is not a professional EKG by any means. It's a mobile EKG. It's in the name, Cardia Mobile. And so first of all, we're not capturing perfect ECG. That is to be expected. Second, the data set and what we capture don't represent the exact same data. And third, in this particular environment, there's a lot of electrical noise that is in including interference into the data that the Cardia Mobile gathers. Now, I am actively, as we speak, actually, back in Canada, working towards gathering larger data sets using the Cardia Mobile. And so hopefully in the future, using this custom data set, we won't have these issues of certainty percentage being low, and it will be a very accurate marker of individuals. So that is something that I am working on as we speak. Good. So come back next year and see the follow-up talk, right? Wonderful. I can't wait. OK, <laughs> so uh, the most upvoted question, how is it possible to gain so much knowledge at the age of 15? Well, 16 now. Oh, but <laughs> sorry, uh, my, my intro was wrong, I'm sorry. No worries. So uh, it, it's hard to say because it's, it's not something that I really focus on necessarily. It's not like um, I, I, I sit here thinking, you know, I'm, I'm working on complex software. It's just what I like to do, right? It's, 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 it's just what I have fun doing, right? And so it's something that I enjoy. I've been doing it for so long now that I, I want to sort of keep working towards it. Yeah, great. OK, I think we've got time for a quick one. One more. Let's see. Oh, OK. Are your projects open source? Are your projects open source? Yes, the vast majority of them are open source, including the apps in my books, uh, the Alive Core Decoder module, quite a few on my GitHub. There are some that are proprietary, like, for example, the ones that I'm working on at IBM for, for right now. Um, but the vast majority are open source. OK, great. Thank you very much, Tanmay. Thank you Big very much. Big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.